The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message, the prayer of perfection. And I'm going to warn you in advance that this was a season when I had a pastor actually come, this kind of, uh, to me it was an interesting story. He came and he said, you know, you challenged me with your prayer life. Can I come to your church and, and uh, in your office and we could pray together a little bit? And I said, sure, because uh, he had heard some teachings on prayer. And so that was a nice compliment, but shortly after that, God said, ask me to teach you to pray. Mm. Instant humility is like, okay, so even though someone wanted to do it and sit with me and pray because I challenged them, on the other hand, God challenged me and said, ask me. That. You know, he doesn't tell you to ask him a question, right? Remember the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray? Um, now, we call this prayer of perfection, and uh, I had some help with that title. Um, but the uh, perfection is maturity in most cases in the Scripture. It's talking about not perfect meaning flawless. It means mature, develop, complete. All things are present. Uh, everything's working as it should. Um, <clears throat> Now, you know, I've always said tongues is perfect prayer. When you pray in tongues, you're praying perfect prayer, but your understanding doesn't know anything. I had a funny feeling that God wasn't telling me to just uh, continue to pray perfect prayer in tongues. He was going to educate me in understanding how to pray more efficiently. Now, keep in mind, this is going to be a one-dose message, but it was four to six months in the development so I had plenty of time to soak these truths, cultivate them, and have them written on the tablet of the heart. But you're going to get it all in one message. So I strongly suggest you take these seven. Seven, what does seven mean? Perfection. Okay. These seven elements and go slow with them. And at any given time in your life, if you would take these seven elements and look at it, it's, it's kind of like an x-ray machine. You can see where you're currently at, strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's the beauty of a relationship with Jesus is that if it's truly an intimate relationship and it's a, a communion, uh, you're going to see at certain times he's going to want to increase in this area and hold you accountable in that area. And uh, uh, I like the expression uh, intentional sanctification. Intentional sanctification. That's... Uh, that's what David did in the Psalms when he said, okay, he wasn't having a bad day, but he just said, search me, O God. See if there's any secret faults so that I do not commit great transgression. In other words, deal with the little foxes in me, Lord. Search me. If these little foxes are dealt with, then I won't make big stumbling errors. So isn't that, that's just wisdom, isn't it? Search me. For anxious thoughts, hurtful ways. Anxious thoughts, what kind of thoughts? Anxious thoughts. Science even teaches that in biology now. Emocognition. Your emotions influence your thinking. Emovolition. Your emotions control your choices. And uh, for the, all the men who say they don't have emotions, I have not yet found one that doesn't have stress. And stress by definition, is to be emote. Oh, they don't like this part. This is their, their feminine side that they don't have. Stress means you're being emotionally controlled by people or circumstances. They're, they're, they're there. And the ones that say they don't have emotions, we've seen you on the road. Jennifer says, what, what they mean is they don't have any good ones. <laughs> All right. You want to get rid of those toxic emotions. Are you ready? Element number one was called undivided attention. 
Now, coming into this season of prayer, what I did was I gave myself to God. You know, I knew that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So I, I did what, what I knew to do in Romans 12, which was, uh, by the mercies of God, I present my body a living sacrifice. And uh, God, this is reasonable service, according to the scripture in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, here's something that to me is extremely important. We repeat it often because when we traveled, we saw this is not a, a common understanding. The, the renewing of the mind, in the Greek, that is nous, N-O-U-S. That is mindset. The renewing of the mind requires the renewing or transformation of mind, will, and emotions, or it doesn't work. That's why we see so much mental ascent in the church that misses out in the spirit because the spirit needs the work of the cross. The cross requires the submission of the mind, the will, and the emotions. It needs them to be weaned of their rule. I always said mind, will, and emotions, our soulish nature is like three bad kids. And, and they'll follow the other one. You know, if the mind goes, oh, we're going to go over, we're going to go over here. It's like a steering wheel. The emotion is the motor. Yeah, 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 let's do that, let's do that. And the will is the clutch, although for, we'll, we'll, for the benefit of those who don't know, understand standard transmission. Well, it's like all of a sudden the motor's going, brum, 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 the emotions. The steering wheel's going, I want to go here, I want to go there, I want to go there. What about you? Not, con, the flesh doesn't consult God in those cases. It's just, I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do it now. And then, poof, Put it in the drive, all right? Once you put it in the drive, that's the wheel going, that's what I choose, all right? Can you see a problem with that? Yeah, see, that's why we've been saying all along in the study of the Song of Solomon, we brought it up uh, again and again, but it's a truth that never leaves. A true intimate relationship with God, a true prayer life must involve uh, all three of those areas because... Uh, Quite frankly, you, they all need to be weaned from their control. And until they're weaned, you don't even meet God, really. Not spirit to spirit. Because they're too noisy. They're too loud. They need to be subdued. They need to be put under the authority so that God can blow the wind of his spirit through your mind, will, and emotions. That's lordship, okay? So I'm offering my body a living sacrifice, and God's going to teach me to pray. And he took a scripture from the Living Bible. And like I said, this took weeks and months, but I'm going to give it to you quickly. What he ultimately did was he bombarded me with the concept as, Dennis, my thoughts are continually toward you. They're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. Now, can you picture a beach and all those little, his thoughts are continually toward me. What he saw was necessary was that these thoughts, overwhelmed by the, the, the sheer number of those thoughts toward me, uh, it says, I can't even count them. They're more than number than the sand. And when I awake, I'm still with you. He dealt with me a beautiful death blow to prayer. At that point in time, as rich as my prayer life was, it was kind of a concept of going in and out of prayer. Kind of like in the morning, I would charge my battery and then let it drain during the day. And you know, people's circumstances can drain that battery real quick if you let them, right? And what he did was, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm giving you my undivided attention. And the more he bathed me in that love and affection, I wanted to reciprocate. But here's the problem with reciprocating. I said, I'm not God. I can't do that. I want to give you back undivided attention, but I can't do that. You know, the Bible does say pray unceasingly. This is a key. He said, no, in your flesh, you cannot give me undivided attention. But your spirit was made capable of communing with me 24-7. So in other words, prayer then transformed from Dennis the talker, the chatterbox that didn't know how to keep silent and was always talking, even when I shouldn't have been, 
I used to interrupt a lot of prayer meetings with my revelation. And then inside I would get this, you know what that was? It was like, you should have shut up. You actually broke the anointing that was in the spirit of the room with something important to say that really may have been valid, but not necessary. Okay? There's a time to listen and a time to speak. And God had to teach me that I don't really have as much to say as I thought I had to say until I've heard something. Oh, okay. All right. So little by little, he's working on me and he's giving me undivided attention, but he's saying your spirit has that capacity to commune with me. And that's when I really understood for the first time that for me, it was like, actually, Jesus did it. He's our perfect example. There's special time and all the time. Jesus had special time, but he said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. That was all the time. So there was special time when we know he left the crowds to go pray on, on, on uh, numerous occasions. So he knew how to get apart for special time, but he also communed all the time. Prayer was not meant to be something, uh, some kind of an action that you go in and out of. Prayer is being with someone. Prayer is being in union and communion with a person. And so the personhood of God, then I said, then if my spirit's able to do that, even when I'm sleeping, my, my spirit can commune with God. And when I awake, you're still there. You didn't go anywhere. Um, and you made us that way to need that kind of sleep. I want to think uh, on you before I go to bed and when I awake. And also, there's a lot of wisdom. Jennifer proved it scientifically. Uh, science will tell you that uh, let not the sun go down on your anger. Deal with your stuff in a day. Sufficient of the day is the evil thereof, da, 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 da. Right? Because it hardwires into long-term memory. Anything you don't deal with, you want to carry it over, it gathers strength. And it hardwires in long-term memory. Keeping short accounts keeps you healthy, spirit, soul, and body. Now, I learned that what he developed at this point was personhood. God is not an it. He's a person. And I want to honor him. I want his mind, his will, and his emotions. Remember, we talked about the car, all right? I can say, and we did this during the Song of Solomon often, I love my car, but guess what? My car doesn't have a personality. If I turn the steering wheel, it goes, I'm in control. If I start it and the motor's running, I'm in the, I'm in the driver's seat. It doesn't argue with me. It does what I tell it to do. But now, lo and behold, I'm in a relationship with a person who has a mind, has a will, and has emotions. And this is true about loving God and loving one another. The way you treat people is the way you treat God. The way you treat God is the way you treat people. And don't try to argue that point with me because it won't work. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. I'm sorry, they're tied together. You can't say, oh, I love God. It's these people I can't stand. Yeah, that, that baggage is in you. But what God's saying is, no, what you're dealing with and I'm going to take you into a more mature prayer life, is I'm going to get you to deal with personality. And there's all kinds. And that means that when you start dealing with God, he has a mind that it might not be. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. <laughs> Just think. And guess what? Am I going to change God's mind? Or do you think the goal is for him to change my mind? Yeah, yeah I think he wants to change my mind. His thoughts are higher why would God want to make lower thoughts? You know, do we want to dumb down God for our benefit or do we want to raise ourselves to his higher road huh? and his thoughts, which are higher? His ways, his choices are different than ours and his emotions. Okay, men that don't have emotions, God is love. He doesn't just have it. He is love. So this exudes from him in everything that he does. Even a corrective word should have all the love of heaven behind it. That's his nature. He's not going to change. He's, he's not a man. He's not going to lie. All right? So undivided attention. What this really healed was as I began to, to look at God as, and, the, and the work of the Spirit in me as a person, it changed from... Uh, 
what I would call even a, 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 an intimate relationship, but a, a, a new depth of knowing that I needed to make adjustments. It wasn't enough to say, I love God. You can go to a backslidden Christian and say, do you love God? And they'll say, yes. But are you in love with him? This is the passionate pursuit of mature prayer. And when God uh, started dealing with this, me about the person, uh, all my friends were, uh, most of them went to Bible school, faith camp type Bible schools, Kenneth Hagin and, and them. And they were word people. And I said, but what God was teaching me this is that he is the word. And Hebrews 4.12 says, all things are naked. I mean, uh, verse 13 says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. There's your person. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It sounds like we're talking about just words. But the word of God is living and powerful. It's Jesus. It's the power of the spirit in us decreeing and declaring his reality. And all things are naked and open to the eyes of it. No, him. It reveals again that the word of God in you needs to be a living word. It needs to be Jesus. Jesus and the word are one. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. And that oneness is, comes about by you dealing with his personality. All right. That's only point one. You can see why I spent four to six months, all right, all right, I better move on, because really what, what, what that was, was the training of undivided attention was, I also believe that he, he ministered to my shortcoming. I think I was Dennis the Menace as a kid growing up, and I think part of my sanctification, part of my maturing process as a Christian was that I didn't have a need to be seen and heard. And God dealt with me and trained me by teaching me to shut up and listen. He used Isaiah 50, verse 4. He says, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, and you will know how to speak a word in season to him who is a weary. You know, I'm going to give you words that are going to have life on them, and that helps people more than your opinion, more than even giving them scripture that's not real to you, but it's just the right answer. We don't need right answers. We need reality. We need the presence and the anointing and the substance of God on those words. Nature and word need to match. You know, even demons are known by their name and nature. So when you preach the word or you give somebody a scriptural answer, it better have the nature of Jesus on it or it's just dead letter. And God wants the reality of it. Now, he told me, Dennis, uh, I'll awaken you morning by morning. I'll awaken you here, here. And to make a long story short, here's what he said. Dennis, when you were in school, did you do all the talking or did the teacher do most of the talking? You did the listening. Well, most of the time. <laughs> I was that kid that would raise their hand when they said, all right, now we're all going to be quiet in this class for the next five minutes. I'd be the one to go, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> okay. So you can see I needed this, right? I know some of you don't, but yes, you do. Uh, <laughs> You need to hear something before you have really have any quality to say. And, uh, of course, I believe in this with all my heart because I incubated on this. I relished this. I cherished this. I walked with him in this. So this is not like a sermon. This is a relationship, and it was training for reigning. Uh, so listening, uh, first, understanding he was a person. Second, listening. And then third, People always say, how long do you pray? I think they, they, they're already laboring when they even ask you that question. How long do you pray? And I'll say, I'll tell you what, until you meet him spirit to spirit, you're not even praying. A lot of people do the talking and the walking and they have to pace when they do it. That's the, that was my old style. That, that's not necessarily praying. Praying is when you have weaned your mind, will, and emotions down to the point where you're touching him spirit to spirit. Now, some Christians get there real fast the minute they close their eyes. I do. I don't struggle. But if you do struggle, if your mind is overactive, your will wants to go do something, think of go look in the garage and see if there's, if there, I got a can of oil in there for the car. Uh, 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 I think I'll pace. Oh, okay. I'll even pray in tongues. But see, even that, as good as it is, you're still doing something. Why not say, teach me to still my flesh, to get still before the Lord, 
And he had to teach me how to wake, how to wait in the, while I'm awake. Uh, and the, uh, uh, here's what I've learned through it all. And I'm quoting from the scripture of uh, Psalm 27, 14. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave and courageous and never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting for he will never disappoint you. We need to hear that. We need, we need to know, that. don't stop. And what happens is all of a sudden, the runaway thoughts go away and you can actually feel that stuff dissipated and I'm meeting him spirit to spirit, breath to breath, heart to heart. And it's a relationship. But you do have to wean that flesh, okay? Number one, that was number one, undivided attention. If we're going to get all seven in today, I'm going to have to move much quicker. You're just going to have to take really good notes. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, in that undivided attention, he, he really taught me how to do that intentional sanctification. Look for anxious thoughts, hurtful choices, because your choices won't be impacted or transformed until you deal with the hurt behind the choice. Your thoughts are not going to be renounced. I see people waste time trying to renounce a lie, renounce a lie. <sighs> Perfect love cares out fear. Quote scripture while they're fortifying their fear. Unless you deal with the power behind the thought, you're not in a position to renounce it. You've got to deal with the power source. If there's anger or fear behind that, that anxious thought, deal with the anxious before you're going to ever have the authority. Once you have peace, I receive forgiveness for giving into the devil's kingdom of anxiety and fear. I receive forgiveness. Oh, there, I got my peace. I renounce that lie, that dot, blah, 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 whatever. From the place of peace, who's ruling? Let the peace of God rule. Who's ruling? Until you have peace, you don't have the authority to renounce. Now, moving on. I'm skipping really good stuff. You need to spend four months on, on each one of these, and you'll just have a great time with God. All right. Second one, welcoming presence. The first was undivided attention, and he got refocused on God. This one is welcoming presence. <clears throat> And this is a good daily devotion. You could do this one uh, in 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> and that is, you know, you hear people talk about the seven pillars of society and the seven mountains and everything. And what God dealt with me is, I'm going to show you the seven mountains in you, and I want to rule every one of those mountains. I'm going to show you seven thrones in you, and I would like to rule every one of them. So the first one was your human spirit. I want peace to rule. We have a peace challenge that we challenge mature Christians to, to see just how much. Did you make decisions by peace? Did you lose your peace? Did you maintain your peace? Did you exude peace <laughs> or something else? You know, uh, And that peace challenge was learning to welcome his presence, but to purify these areas in your life, I needed to deal with seven thrones. These seven thrones were, there's that number seven again. No wonder this is pr the prayer of perfection. He said, first start with your spirit, all right? And here's what we used to do when we travel, when we go to churches, because sometimes we'd have witches show up and new agers, and because the title of the message would be discernment and discerning of spirits. Well, that, that attracted all kinds of people from all over. Uh, but what we would say is, all right now, spirit, we want today. And then I would have the audience repeat it after me. We only want the Holy Spirit. We don't want any other spirit other than Holy Spirit. Let's say that together. Let's renounce it out loud that we don't want any spirit. We don't want no new age spirit. We don't want no witchcraft. And you know, witchcraft can be simply uh, your fleshly desire to dominate, to, uh, to intimidate, and to manipulate, and let your yes be yes, your no be no, or your heart's not pure. You're into witchcraft. Mm -hmm. It's not the funny little hat. 
You're into witchcraft when you won't let your yes be yes and your no be no because anything that other than that is of the evil one. So you don't manipulate, you don't intimidate, and you don't try to dominate because you will lose. You will enter into the wrong kingdom. So let's renounce every spirit but the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what God basically did there was in purifying your heart, I want spirit rule. The next uh, area, of course, was uh, <clears throat> the mind. And I already knew that his thoughts needed to be my thoughts. What are you thinking? The next area was the will. My choices. Am I doing what I want to do? My likes and my dislikes? Or am I doing the will of God? People need to check preference. A lot of times people are calling God told me, which is nothing more than preference. You're just doing what you want to do. That's flesh. Um, spirit, mind, will, emotions. Learning how to bring them under the lordship of Jesus, you would actually experience the God emotions, the fruit of the Spirit. Your physical body. Matter of fact, we've got a book on releasing the divine healer. During that stage, we would just, in our time of prayer, Jennifer and I, we pray in the same room, and that's, that's, that's good for husband and wife, in the same room, and then we would, we would like, it would be like soaking, only it would be drawing on Jesus, the healer in me, to flow to that portion of my body that is aching or problematic. I don't call for healing to fall out of the sky from heaven. I've got heaven in me. I've got Jesus in me. I've got the healer living in me. That's, distance is a deception, but it's very common for people to be calling on heaven. Yes, he's in heaven, but the whole point of him coming to, into you was to get heaven on earth through you. All right? So then I would, we would pray healing that way for our physical body. Then he would mess with you and say, all relationships. I want to be Lord, and I want you to welcome my presence into all relationships. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay? <laughs> That's just not love them that love you back. All right? And I will give you wisdom on how to navigate in those relationships accordingly. Because just because you release loving forgiveness to them doesn't mean you, don't may, you may need to still establish boundaries. You have to love with wisdom. All right? Then with, after you've allowed God to search your heart on all relationships, the good, the bad, and the ugly, then it was stewardship over your giftings, your talents, your job, ministry, your possessions, your house, everything you own. And in this time of incubation, he really trains us that we are stewards and not owners. If there's any ownership you might be into idolatry with something that's perfectly legitimate in and of itself. Remember, we used to talk about uh, some of our relatives that were education. There's not a thing wrong with education, but you can make it idolatrous. You can make anything an idol. You can make your children an idol. You are a steward, not an owner. We used to have to give that on little cards to people when we would see that, but you don't understand, I'm the responsible one. And it was usually over-responsibility. And it was Romans 14, 4 in the Living Bible. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. God is able to make them do as they should. Well, I just put a little damper on your control button. huh? Steward, not an owner. They're God's children, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. Then one day God got me. And he says, apply that to yourself, Dennis. And I went, I'm God's servant, not mine. I belong to him and not to me. <laughs> uh, he can mess with you. He can take any one of these outlines and deal successfully with perfecting and maturing your prayer life. Not to mention the transformation and the fruit that can result. All right. Third level, and at first it came as a question. The third level was, ask where you trust. And really what he was doing 
was saying, Dennis, you've got discernment. You have discernment. In other words, you've got the Jesus in you. Let him discern. The living word discern you. Don't worry about discerning somebody else. Let the living word discern you. To discern means to differentiate, to allow yourself to see what is the source. True discernment goes by the source. You know, you can say, oh, that's a lovely dress you've got on, Sally. And it can have a lot of uh, jealousy behind it. That's a nice dress you got on, but really I'd rather have it on me instead of on you, is what the spirits say, and regardless of the nicety of the words coming out of your mouth. The source, the source, discernment goes for the source. The initiation needs to be pure. Now, uh, <clears throat> in, in uh, asking where you trust, we use a little... Uh, a little uh, uh, statement here where we say T-R-Y. Try. It's the opposite of trust. Try is to temporarily resist yielding. T-R-Y. Temporarily resist yielding. That's where you take matters into your own hands and you're a mover and a shaker and you think you're getting a lot of stuff done. Um, we used to have a sign in the factory where I worked is how come there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over? All right? That's what trying can get you. You can be very, very busy, but you just may have to do it again and again until you do it right. All right? But you were in a hurry. I can't wait. I've got to try this now. All right? So asking where you trust, God literally showed me the, the beauty in the picture in Luke, where remember when they went to push Jesus off a cliff? He walked through the midst. He said, that's what I want you to learn. I go, I, how do I walk through the midst of people? <laughs> Come on, everybody stand up and I'm going to walk through you. you know? No, he says, in the spirit, there is a fourth choice that the flesh doesn't know. The flesh only knows fight, flight, fall down and be a doormat, faint. The flesh only knows fight back, run away, lay down and be a doormat, none of which are real appealing. God says, but there's a fourth choice in your will. If you yield your will to the will of God, nothing is going to force you to do anything that I haven't already planned. My will, not your will. The fourth choice is a surrendered will. Let the peace of God rule. Pushing and shoving and manipulating all of that, it'll come back on you eventually. Running away will come back on you. Where are you going to run? Where are you going to hide? Jonah tried that. It didn't work well. I don't want to see any of you getting eaten up by a whale and spit out somewhere. All right? Running away doesn't work. That's fear. Pushing and shoving, it's flesh. Laying down and being a doormat. That's not humility. That's a lack of self, self esteem that comes from God. God confidence versus self confidence. All right. The, um, but that third element trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on this understanding. Acknowledge Him. And what He really brought to light in teaching me to yield and trust instead of try and really uh, assess to whether or not I was trying or was I trusting. Because there's a difference in your, if you let the Holy Spirit discern you, you can tell whether you're trying or you're relaxing and abiding in Him. Uh, he said, he took me to that scripture, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, and it said, trust in the Lord with all your heart, now, you have to know location. You have to know your parts. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What is your heart? That's your spirit. This is the epicenter. This is where the conscience is. This is the seat of the emotions. And all of your heart would be your mind, will, and emotions, and spirit. All of your heart. But it said, be careful you don't lean on this. This will sabotage it. 
So it says, acknowledge. And you know, I used to read that as a young Christian. I read, acknowledge him in all your ways. I would think about him in all my ways. I'm going, but lean not on my understanding, but think about him. But that's not what that means. Acknowledge there comes from uh, the Hebrew word that means through divine intimate connection. Out of that divine intimate connection, he will direct your path. So your direction is coming from your spirit, not your thoughts. Lean not on this. Don't think you're going to outsmart God or figure it out. But acknowledge him. Acknowledge in your spirit through divine intimate connection, relationship, and he will direct your path. You need to go from the heart. You need to be directed from the heart. You need to let the heart direct, but you've got to know where your heart is. We've got huge percentage of the body of Christ. Matter of fact, preachers used to say this. We have to get it. We have to get it 18 inches. We got to get it down from our head 18 inches to the blood pumper. Jesus didn't come into the blood pumper. Jesus came into your spirit, and this is the epicenter of your spirit. You better get the location right, or you're going to confuse it. It's not all a Valentine's Day heart. All right? And actually, they've done a great injustice because of the culture and the use of the word heart. Uh, King James was better off. They had belly, bowels, reins, kidneys. That's a lot lower than this. There's even a French translation that (laughs) made it even worse. It says chest. Out of your chest will flow. No. Look at the original Greek and Hebrew, and we have that in most of our material. We have to keep reiterating that because you got people, people trying to pay attention to their blood pumper. Matter of fact, even science knows better. As a matter of fact, ungodly, unsaved people know better. You talk to unsaved policemen or firemen, and they say, I just went with my gut on certain things, and it saved our lives. I went with my gut. Unsaved people. And you got New Agers. Matter of fact, Christians can't even use the word center anymore because uh, New Agers hijacked it, center. But you know what they're talking about down here? Why are Christians the ones who think Jesus came into their blood pumper? Even Even cultish people know, unsaved people know, location, location, location. You don't get that right. You're sabotaging your own Christian walk. All right, enough of that. Enough of that reprimanding you. Point to your heart. This is your Bible heart. They're even calling in science a second brain. There's, this, there's almost as many neurons in the gut as there is here. This is Jennifer's area. She likes to talk about it. And when the, the, uh, the embryo uh, breaks in half. Half goes to the brain, the neural crest. Half goes to the brain and the spinal column and peripheral nerves. The other half goes to the gut. And then by the left vagus nerve, it connects to the emotional center in your brain. But it happens here first. Okay, did you just jump now when I did that? Well, guess what? Emotions cascaded through your whole body before you knew what the heck I was talking about. If you suddenly heard a loud crash, pow, emotions would cascade from here up. Your head's going, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? It's informed later. And the whole church has been taught, don't live by your feelings. Don't live by your feelings. Guess what? They were wrong. They took a half-truth and exaggerated it. No, you're not supposed to live by those carnal, toxic emotions. But your emotions need to be your friends telling you who's ruling. Because if you're living in hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, guess what? Jesus isn't ruling. And if you don't deal with it, he's not ruling. Oh, he's ruling theoretically. (laughs) He hasn't gone anywhere. But he's not ruling in your life at that moment. I wished everybody could have an angel walk through their house with a sign going. Every time you have a toxic emotion, Jesus isn't ruling right now. You're in disobedience right now. 
Somebody needs to call and account for it. That's just the way I am. That's my personality. Okay, we'll see how well that holds up in the court of heaven. All right. What are we on? Number four. <laughs> Ask where your trust is three. You have these down? Because you're going to spend years on these. All right. Undivided attention is number one. Undivided attention. This is t you toward God. He's already doing this to you, and you need to appreciate that. Secondly, welcome presence in all seven areas. Those seven areas are spirit, mind, will, emotions, your physical body, all relationships, and all stuff. The stewardship of everything, everything and anything that you own. Gifts, talents, money, cars, whatever. The third area is really in your relationship with the Lord. See who's really ruling instead of playing church. Or worse, how many new believers get so excited about Jesus, their heart was awakened to that precious love, and then they get burned out. Have you ever heard that expression? Burned out. Have you ever seen it burned out? Have you ever done it burned out? Guess what? You were in the flesh more than you were in the spirit, no matter how sincere. Is it possible you could be sincerely wrong? <laughs> yeah. We saw it with forgiveness. We had people trying to forgive people for a year or so. Well, guess what? You know what that means? It's instant. It didn't take you. It was instant when he came in, cleansed you of your sin, and forgave you. You didn't have to say, well, when God's ready to forgive, he will. What, that sin would abound? He would enjoy that? That's nonsense. All these excuses people have made up for their shortcomings rather than letting God search their heart. And mature. This is the prayer of perfection, of maturing. And this is necessary. All right. The next one, uh, he taught me that I had a fourth choice in the trust. I could walk through the crowd if I would yield to him. The fourth element was, uh, it, it came from a statement that I read somewhere and God said, that's exactly what I'm speaking to you. And I don't remember where I read it, but it was attitude determines performance. And God said, absolutely. Your attitude will determine how you perform. But here's where he brought in the correction. He said that attitude, people think in terms of positive attitude and negative attitude. And God says the only true positive is a work of the cross. Everything else is nice or not nice, plus or minus, but it can all be carnal. The only true positive in your life is that which passes through death yet lives. Actually, is an end product of the cross, which is true resurrection life. God only builds with quality material. He only builds with life. He don't build with wood, hay, or stubble. So he doesn't care about how positive your attitude is if it hasn't passed through the cross. If it hasn't been resurrection life if it hasn't produced zoe or the god kind of life so he really showed me that if this attitude was in you that was also you know you see in the scripture it says have this mind that was in christ jesus actually have this attitude is actually even a better translation have this attitude that was in him this spiritual disposition not mental positive negative but a spiritual disposition or an attitude of the heart have this attitude of the heart that he had. And, you know, it, it covers uh, uh, all these core values of Philippians 2, verses uh, 5, particularly. But um, what God wanted to say was forgiveness needs to be a lifestyle. Now, in our church, when we've taught people to locate properly, they say, I drop down. All right, drop down is actually the Greek word enduo. Enduo means to sink into in order to be clothed. So when you read a scripture like, let the peace that surpasses all understanding guard your heart and your mind, you had to go to him for him to do it. You have to go down before you go up. We even, we even taught a Christian school, a third grader raised his hand and said, everybody knows there's no living water in your head. you got to go to Jesus within. And then it comes up and influences the mind. 
So this attitude showed me that forgiveness needed to be a lifestyle. And we've often quoted, uh, I forget the guy's name, but uh, he made that statement, we are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. If you're really living your Christian life, forgiveness is not a struggle for you. It's not what it does to the other person. It sets you free. It gets you out of the prison of resentment and torment. It may do nothing for the other person by you forgiving, but you get released. You get set free. It gives them opportunity to respond in the spirit, but they don't have to. So, and by the way, there's, there needs to be always clarification. Every message we try to sneak it in there. Um, restoration or uh, is not the same as forgiveness. Forgiveness is not automatically reconciliation and total restoration. You forgive, that can be one-sided. Jesus was on the cross, if Father forgive them, they know not what they do. I don't know how many of them reconcile their life to God. But he made it unilateral. He made it one way. You need to live one way. Now, <clears throat> after that fourth element, the fifth element was something that to me was just balanced, a balanced perspective. It was love and discernment. And Philippians 3.10 was my railroad track scripture. Philippians 3.10 was that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. But what the Lord was showing me in Ephesians, you know, it talks about the love being the height, the width, the length, and the depth. Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't like yard work. I despised yard work. I had a hard time maintaining my Christianity doing yard work. Some people relax when they do that. For me, it's a punishment, all right? But God showed me the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God was a cube. And actually, the new Jerusalem is a cube. This is my bride, fully developed, coming down out of heaven, my bride. The height, the width, the length, and the depth is a perfect cube in its dimension. Ephesians talks about the the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. I would imagine it would be if it's God is complete, right? All four. Well, God showed me mine. Dennis, your height. Oh, you're a worshiper. You love to worship. You love prayer. Oh, you got your building is nice and high. Vision. Oh, yeah, I had vision. I was giving it to other pastors in case they didn't have any. Oh, your vision. Oh, your, your, your building is high and long. And yes, you do have victory over the devil. So you got a good foundation. You see what's wrong with this building yet? There was one dimension missing. It was long, it was high, it was deep, it was skinny. He said, because your width, if you can't bring my presence into the mundane like cutting grass. Uh, devastated. That probably was a two-week thing right there. And I finally dealt with it, and guess what happened? Neighbor, two doors down. His wife said, you can't get a riding lawnmower. That's lazy. Your yard isn't big enough. The only way I would say go buy a riding lawnmower is if you go do Dennis's too. Am I glad that I dealt with that properly? I had my yard work was done from that time on once I dealt with it in my heart. I had to go out there at least once going, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Uh, of course, I had to push more. I didn't have to uh, ride anymore. I love you, Jesus. Oh, I'm going to pick those weeds. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad I finally dealt with that. Uh, and then my neighbor did it from that time on. Isn't it good to deal with your stuff? You never know how God's going to respond. But don't think I'm coming to do yours, though. Uh, no, we have a guy. <laughs> I have a guy I can recommend. Okay. All right. So love and discernment. <clears throat> was basically showing you how do you develop the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. Check out which one. Do you have vision? Do you understand what your, your ultimate intention is as a believer for the future? 
is your victory over the devil or you got, you've given the devil more credit than God? How do you handle the mundane of life? Do you bring Jesus into the store, the school, the workplace? The width. Don't be like my skinny. You know, the wind could have blew my little. I don't care how, how, how much worship I did. <laughs> if, you can't, if you can't minister it out in real life, uh, wind will knock that tall building right over. It needs to be a cube. It needs to be fully developed. The height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. All right. The next area. Affirmation. Oh, this one was so hard. Most Christians, you love it when you get a revelation. God was saying, that's not good enough. He gave me that threefold plan. I'm going to give you a revelation or a reality, but I'm going to expect you to cultivate it. Cultivated means by reason of use. <laughs> Cultivate it until you can check your own heart and say if there was fruit. Ah, I used to like people that just had revelations and they would just spout them off. Didn't have to impact them. Didn't have to change their life. Matter of fact, they kind of look kind of good. You're in the limelight. Oh, you had a revelation. You spoke this. You said that. Yeah. But God says, I want you to take that revelation I'll teach you to cultivate it by the power of my spirit till you own it, till it's written on the tablet of your heart. Affirmation for me was not a pat on the back. Oh, good word, Dennis. Affirmation for me was, are you living it? Do you own it? Is it easier to do than to not do? <clears throat> That's where you look for the fruit. Revelation, cultivation, and fruit. The lab we are laborers together with God, and we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. And uh, I don't have it up here right now, but uh, Jennifer did a beautiful booklet on uh, the humanity of Jesus. And that's really what we've got to get back to, is that understanding that he's trying to get his humanity through us, but that's his personality. It's not like your car where it does whatever you want it to do. You're in the driver's seat. The humanity of Jesus, he wants to express himself. Remember, he, he did it perfectly, so he is our example. What did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whoa. He expressed through divinity and through humanity, he expressed the Father. God wants to see that kind of demonstration through us. Now, affirmation was, is it written on the tablet of my heart? That's really what God was saying. In other words, whatever you say was just came right off the page in my Bible. It really spoke to me. Instead of just blurting it out, to what degree have you applied it to your own life? And when you look back on it in a week or two, can you see that it's changed you? I often, um, I'm a little bit skeptical of some people who have gone to heaven and back because there's, on occasion you'll run into someone that's been to heaven and back and they haven't changed. That just makes me say, God, was that really you? I'm not going to judge them based on uh, their testimony, but you know what? I'm going to question whether or not I'm going to be looking for fruit. Yeah. We're supposed to be fruit inspectors. I'll tell you what, if I die and go to heaven and come back, I'm going to scare you half to death because I'm going to be changed, transformed, and you're going to hear all about it, right? But if I go, if I can't really explain how I felt, if I can't really explain with any kind of credibility that it changed my life, I'm not real interested. I'm not even interested in anybody's revelation if it hasn't changed you. Really. Are you living in it? Are you walking it out to the best of your ability? I know it can be a progressive revelation. It can be just like our knowledge of God, but are you walking it out? And that affirmation is something. You want to know if it's written on the tablet of your heart? Write those three things down. Revelation or scripture? Did I cultivate it? Did I meditate on it? Did I do pray the word, not just read the word? It's like uh, drink instead of think and, and feed instead of read. You can read the scripture in a prayerful attitude and it'll accomplish a whole lot more. 
than just your intellect understanding the words. So don't let mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. That's what really that affirmation was. Learning to receive and stay there and pray the word until you felt as though you owned it. Now that's a subjective experience, but you know if it's still a mystery to you, then you don't own it yet. If it's not bringing life to you, there's no inner witness of life or resurrection on it, then you haven't got there yet. All right. Now, the last area. And we're kind of a stickler for this. I don't see evangelism the way a lot of people see evangelism. A lot of people see evangelism as winning someone to Jesus. That's only part of it. It was go ye into all the world and make disciples. And disciples, until this gospel of the kingdom is preached, I say until this gospel of the kingdom is demonstrated. It has to go beyond lip service. They will know you by your love one to another. That's character. That's not just words. And demonstration is to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only and delude yourself. But the effectual doer, this man is blessed in what he does. Effectual doer means that in him I live and move and have my being. And when I, we looked at the purpose of mankind, uh, uh, Jennifer did a word study once and I says, I have um, four core understanding of why we were made. And she did a uh, what, what God predestined us to do. And she did a word study on the word predestined just in the New Testament. And there's four that matched mine. Mine was uh, relationship, character, function, and reproduce. Just going to Genesis is why God make mankind. He made him for a relationship. He made him to have the love nature in him. He made him to function properly in this world. He, he has works for you to do. And lastly, he wanted you to reproduce, but you reproduce according to kind. Jennifer looked up predestined, and it lined up with, instead of just a relationship, a trust relationship where you develop with God, whom he predestined, he called. Well, he called you to what? A relationship. Romans 8.30. You were predestined to a relationship. He called you. Romans 8.29, the previous verse, you were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Character. So you were called for a relationship, but you were called to character. You were predestined to be conformed to the image. He, wants you, he expects you to change, mature. Thirdly, predestined us to the adoption as, and we entered a, added a word in here, Sabbath sons. Not just sons, but what kind of sons? Sons that walked in the Sabbath or the rest of God, the peace of God. Sabbath sons, predestined. That and only that way will your function be the way God intended. You work out of stress, God's not impressed with that. He doesn't build with wood, hay, or stubble. And lastly, purpose or reproduction. Romans 1.11 predestined according to the purpose of him. And what was his purpose? To reproduce according to kind. So you be the best kind you can be in order to reproduce because you will reproduce according to your kind. So Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name that you will take these words and perfect us and mature us and bring us into a greater relationship with you in the days ahead. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.